from Origen's Commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, Book 12, Chapter 36, Concerning the Transfiguration of the Savior. Now, after six days, according to Matthew and Mark, he takes with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and leads them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. Now also, let it be granted, before the exposition that occurs to us in relation to these things, that this took place long ago and according to the letter. But it seems to me that those who are led up by Jesus into the high mountain and are deemed worthy of beholding his transfiguration apart are not without purpose led up six days after the discourses previously spoken. For since in six days the perfect number, the whole world, this perfect work of art was made, on this account I think that he who transcends all the things of the world by beholding no longer the things which are seen, for they are temporal, but already the things which not seen, and only the things which are not seen, because that they are eternal, is represented in the words, After six days Jesus took up with him certain persons. If, therefore, any one of us wishes to be taken by Jesus and led up by him into the high mountain, and be deemed worthy of beholding his transfiguration apart, let him pass beyond the six days, because he no longer beholds the things which are seen, nor longer loves the world, nor the things in the world, nor lusts after any worldly lust, which is the lust of bodies and the riches of the body, and of the glory which is after the flesh, and whatever things whose nature it is to distract and drag away the soul from the things which are better and diviner, and bring it down and fix it fast to the deceit of this age, in wealth and glory and the rest of the desires which are the foes of truth. For when he has passed through the six days, as we have said, he will keep a new Sabbath, rejoicing in the lofty mountain, because he sees Jesus transfigured before him. For the word has different forms, as he appears to each as is expedient for the beholder, and is manifested to no one beyond the capacity of the beholder. Chapter 37 Force of the Words Before Them But you will ask if, when he was transfigured before those who were led up by him into the lofty mountain. He appeared to them in the form of God, in which he formerly was, so that he had to those below the form of a servant, but to those who had followed him after the six days to the lofty mountain, he had not that form, but the form of God. But hear these things if you can, at the same time giving heed spiritually, that it is not said simply, he was transfigured but with a certain necessary addition, which Matthew and Mark have recorded. For according to both, he was transfigured before them. And according to this, indeed, you will say that it is possible for Jesus to be transfigured before some with this transfiguration, but before others, at the same time, not to be transfigured. But if you wish to see the transfiguration of Jesus before those who went up into the lofty mountain apart, along with him, behold with me the Jesus in the Gospels, as more simply apprehended, and, as one might say, known according to the flesh by those who do not go up, through works and words which are uplifting, to the lofty mountain of wisdom, but known no longer after the flesh, but known in his divinity by means of all the Gospels, and beholden in the form of God,
according to their knowledge. For before them is Jesus transfigured, and not to any one of those below. But when he is transfigured, his face also shines like the sun, that he may be manifested to the children of light, who have put off the works of darkness, and put on the armor of light, and are no longer the children of darkness or night, but have become the sons of day, and walk honestly as in the day. And being manifested, he will shine unto them, not simply as the sun, but as demonstrated to be the sun of righteousness. Chapter 38 The Garments White as the Light And not only is he transfigured before such disciples, nor does he only add to the transfiguration the shining of his face as the sun, but further also to those who were led up by him into the high mountain apart. His garments appear white as the light. But the garments of Jesus are the expressions and letters of the Gospels with which he invested himself. But I think that even the words in the Apostles which indicate the truths concerning him are garments of Jesus, which become white to those who go up into the high mountain along with Jesus. But since there are differences also of things white, his garments become white as the brightest and purest of all white things, and that is light. When, therefore, you see anyone not only with a thorough understanding of the theology concerning Jesus, but also making clear every expression of the Gospels, do not hesitate to say that to him the garments of Jesus have become white as the light. But when the Son of God in his transfiguration is so understood and beheld, that his face is a sun and his garments white as the light, straightway there will appear to him who beholds Jesus in such form, Moses, the law, and Elijah, in the way of Synecdoche, not one prophet only, but all the prophets, holding converse with Jesus. For such is the force of the words, talking with him. But according to Luke, Moses and Elijah appeared in glory, down to the words, in Jerusalem. But if anyone sees the glory of Moses, having understood the spiritual law as a discourse in harmony with Jesus, and the wisdom in the prophets which is hidden in a mystery, he sees Moses and Elijah in glory when he sees them with Jesus. Chapter 39 Jesus was transfigured as he was praying. Since it will be necessary to expound the passage as given in Mark, and as he was praying, he was transfigured before them, we must say that perhaps it is possible especially to see the word transfigured before us, if we have done the things Afer said, and gone up into the mountain, and seen the absolute word holding converse with the Father and praying to him for such things as the true high priest might pray for to the only true God. But in order that he may thus hold fellowship with God and pray to the Father, he goes up into, into the mountain. And then, according to Mark, his garments become white and glistening as the light, so as no fuller on earth can whiten them. And perhaps the fullers upon the earth are the wise men of this world who are careful about the diction which they consider to be bright and pure, so that even their base thoughts and false dogmas seem to be beautified by their bleaching, so to speak. But he who shows his own garments glistering to those who have ascended and brighter than their bleaching can make them is the word who exhibits in the expressions of the scriptures which are despised by many 
the glistering of the thoughts. When the raiment of Jesus, according to Luke, becomes white and dazzling. Chapter 40 Discussion of the Saying of Peter But let us next see what was the thought of Peter when he answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, etc. And on this account, these words call for very special examination, because Mark, in his own person, has added, For he knew not what to answer. But Luke, not knowing what he spoke, he says, You will consider, therefore, if Peter spoke these things as in a trance, being filled with the Spirit which moved him to say these things, which could not be a holy spirit. For John taught in the gospel that before the resurrection of the Savior, no one had the Holy Spirit, saying, For the Spirit was not yet, because Jesus was not yet glorified. But if the Spirit was not yet, and Peter, not knowing what he said, spoke under the influence of some spirit, the spirit which caused these things to be said was some one of the spirits which had not yet been triumphed over in the cross, nor made a show of along with them, about whom it is written, having put off from himself the principalities and the powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. But this spirit was perhaps that which is called a stumbling block by Jesus, and which is spoken of as Satan in the passage Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. But I know well that such things will offend many who meet with them, because they think that it is opposed to sound reason that he should be spoken ill of, who a little before had been pronounced blessed by Jesus, on the ground that the Father in heaven had revealed to him the things concerning the Savior, to wit, that he was truly Jesus, and the Christ, and the Son of the living God. But let such a one attend more exactly to the statements about Peter and the rest of the apostles, how even they made requests as if they were yet alien from him who was to redeem them from the enemy, and purchase them with his own precious blood. Or let them also who will have it that even before the passion of Jesus the apostles were perfect. Tell us whence it came about that Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But to anticipate something else of what follows, and apply it to the subject at hand, I would raise in turn these questions. Whether it is possible for anyone to find occasion of stumbling in Jesus apart from the working of the devil who caused him to stumble, and whether it is possible for anyone to deny Jesus, and that in the presence of a little maid and a doorkeeper and men most worthless, unless a spirit had been with him in his denial, hostile to the spirit which is given and the wisdom which is given to those who are assisted by God to make confession, according to a certain desert of theirs. But he who has learned to refer the roots of sin to the father of sin, the devil, will not say that apart from him either the apostles were caused to stumble, or that Peter denied Christ thrice before that well-known crop crowing. But if this be so, consider whether perhaps with a view to make Jesus stumble, so far as was in his power, and to turn Jesus aside from the dispensation whose characteristic was suffering that brought salvation to men, which Jesus undertook with great willingness, seeking to effect these things which seemed to contribute to this end, he himself also here wishes, as it were, by deceit, to draw away Jesus, as if calling upon him no longer to condescend to men and come to them and undergo death for them, but to abide on the high mountain with Moses and Elijah. 
But he promised also to build three tabernacles, one apart for Jesus, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, as if one tabernacle would not have sufficed for the three, if it had been necessary for them to be in tabernacles and in the high mountain. And perhaps also in this he acted with evil intent, when he incited Peter, who did not know what he said, not desiring that Jesus and Moses and Elijah should be together, but desiring to separate them from one another under pretext of the three tabernacles. And likewise it was a lie, it is good for us to be here, for if it had been a good thing they would also have remained there. But if it were a lie, you will seek to know who caused the lie to be spoken, and especially since, according to John, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And as there is no truth apart from the working of him who says, I am the truth, so there is no lie apart from him who is the enemy of truth. These contrary qualities, accordingly, were still in Peter, truth and falsehood. And from truth, he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But from falsehood, he said, May God be propitious to you, Lord, this shall not be unto you. And also, it is good for us to be here. But if anyone will not admit that Peter spoke these things from any evil inspiration, but that his words were of his own mere choice, and it is demanded of him how he will interpret, not knowing what he said, and for he did not know what to answer, he will say that in the former case Peter held it to be a shameful thing and unworthy of Jesus to admit that the Son of the living God, the Christ, whom already the Father had revealed to him, should be killed. And in the present case, that as having seen the two forms of Jesus and the one at the transfiguration which was much more excellent, being well pleased with that, he said that it was good to make their sojourning in that mountain, in order that he himself and those with him might rejoice as they beheld the transfiguration of Jesus and his face shining as the sun, and his garments white as the light, and in addition to these things might always behold in glory those whom they had once seen in glory, Moses and Elijah, and that they might rejoice at the things which they might hear as they talked and held intercourse with each other, Moses and Elijah with Jesus, and Jesus with them. Chapter 41 Figural Interpretation of the Same But since we have not yet spent our energy in interpreting the things in the place figuratively, but have see it, said these things by way of searching into the mere letter, let us, in conformity with these things, consider whether the aforesaid Peter and the sons of thunder, who were taken up into the mountain of the dogmas of the truth, and who saw the transfiguration of Jesus and of Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory with him, might wish to make tabernacles in themselves for the word of God who was going to dwell in them, and for his law which had been beheld in glory, and for the prophecy which spake of the decease of Jesus which he was about to accomplish. And Peter, as one loving the contemplative life, and having preferred that which was delightsome in it to the life among the crowd with its turmoil, said with the design of benefiting those who desired it, Lord, it is good for us to be here. But since love seeks not its own, Jesus did not do that which Peter thought good. Wherefore Jesus descended from the mountain to those who were not able to ascend to it and behold his transfiguration, that they might behold him in such form as they were able to see him. 
It is therefore the part of a righteous man who possesses the love which seeks not its own, to be free from all, but to bring himself under bondage of all those below, that he might gain the more from them. But some one, with reference to what we have alleged about the trance and the working of an evil spirit in Peter, concerning the words, not knowing what he said, not accepting that interpretation of ours, may say that there were certain mentioned by Paul desiring to be teachers of the law, who do not know about what they speak, but who, though they do not clearly expound the nature of what is said, nor understand their meaning, make confident affirmations of things which they do not know. Of such a nature was the affection of Peter also, for not apprehending what was good with reference to the dispensation of Jesus and of those who appeared in the mountain, Moses and Elijah, he says, It is good for us to be here, not knowing what he said, for he did not know what to say. For if a wise man will understand the things from his own mouth and carries prudence in his lips, he who is not so does not understand the things from his own mouth, nor comprehend the nature of the things spoken by him. Chapter 42 The Meaning of the Bright Cloud Next to these come the words, While he was yet speaking, behold, also a bright cloud overshadowed them. Now, I think that God, wishing to dissuade Peter from making three tabernacles, under which, so far as it depended on his choice, he was going to dwell, shows a tabernacle better, so to speak, and much more excellent, the cloud. For since it is the function of a tabernacle to overshadow him who is in it, and to shelter him, and the bright cloud overshadowed them, God made, as it were, a divine tabernacle, inasmuch as it was bright, that it might be to them a pattern of the resurrection to come. For a bright cloud overshadows the just, who are at once protected and illuminated and shone upon by it. But what might the bright cloud which overshadows the just be? Is it perhaps the fatherly power from which comes the voice of the Father, bearing testimony to the Son as beloved and well-pleasing, and exhorting those who were under its shadow to hear him and no other one? But as he speaks of old, so does always he speak through what he wills. And perhaps, too, the Holy Spirit is the bright cloud which overshadows the just, and prophesies of the things of God, who works in it, and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But I would venture also to say that our Savior is a bright cloud. When, therefore, Peter said, Let us make here three tabernacles, one from the Father himself, one from the Son, and one from the Holy Spirit, for a bright cloud of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit overshadows the genuine disciples of Jesus, or a cloud overshadows the gospel and the law and the prophets, which is bright to him who was able to see the light of it in the gospel and the law and the prophets. But perhaps the voice from the cloud says to Moses and Elijah, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. As they were desirous to see the Son of Man, and to hear him, and to behold him as he was in glory. And perhaps it teaches the disciples that he who was in a literal sense the Son of God, and his beloved in whom he was well pleased, whom it behooved them especially to hear, was he who was then beheld and transfigured, and whose face shone as the sun, and who was clothed with garments white as the light. 
Chapter 43 Relation of Moses and Elijah to Jesus The Injunction of Silence But after these things it is written that when they heard the voice from the cloud bearing testimony to the sun, the three apostles, not being able to bear the glory of the voice and power resting upon it, fell on their face and besought God, for they were sore afraid at the supernatural sight and the things which were spoken from the sight. But consider if you can also say this with reference to the details in the passage, that the disciples, having understood that the Son of God had been holding conference with Moses, and that it was he who said, A man shall not see my face and live. And taking further the testimony of God about him, as not being able to endure the radiance of the word, humbled themselves under the mighty hand of God. But after the touch of the word, lifting up their eyes, they saw Jesus only and no other. Moses, the law, and Elijah, the prophet, became one only with the gospel of Jesus. And not as they were formerly three did they so abide, but the three became one. But consider these things with me in relation to mystical matters. For in regard to the bare meaning of the letter, Moses and Elijah, having appeared in glory and talked with Jesus, went away to the place from which they had come, perhaps to communicate the words which Jesus spoke with them to those who were to be benefited by him almost immediately, namely, at the time of the Passion, when many bodies of the saints that had fallen asleep, their tombs being opened, were to go to the city which is truly holy, not the Jerusalem which Jesus wept over, and there appear unto many, but after the dispensation in the mountain, when the disciples were coming down from the mountain, in order that, when they had come to the multitude, they might serve the Son of God concerning the salvation of the people, Jesus commanded the disciples, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man rise from the dead. But that saying, Tell the vision to no man, is like that which was investigated in the passage above when he enjoined the disciples to tell no man that he was the Christ. Wherefore, the things that were said at that passage may be useful to us also for the passage before us, since Jesus wishes also, in accordance with these, that the things of his glory should not be spoken of before his glory after the Passion. For those who heard, and in particular the multitudes, would have been injured when they saw him crucified, who had been so glorified. Wherefore, since his being glorified in the resurrection was akin to his transfiguration, and to the vision of his face as the sun, on this account he wishes that these things should then be spoken of by the apostles, when he rose from the dead. End of chapter 43